Welcome, friends. It's really wonderful to be able to gather yet again through these difficult days. We welcome all members of uh, Knox St. Paul United Church, as well as St. Peter's Catholic Church, Reverend Aaron, myself, Father Matthew, welcome you here on this fifth Sunday of Lent. Our gospel reading today comes from John chapter 11. It's a little bit condensed because it's a long reading. But a man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the town of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. When Jesus got the message, he said, This sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's Son. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, but oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed on where he was two more days. And after the two days, he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. They said, Rabbi, you can't do that. The Jews are out to kill you, and you're going back? He said these things and then announced, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up. When Jesus finally got there, he found Lazarus already four days dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, only a couple of miles away, and many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother. Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, he'll give you. Jesus said, Your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know that he'll be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. You don't have to wait for the end. I am right now resurrection and life, says Jesus. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? Yes, Master. All along I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. After saying this, she went to her sister Mary and whispered in her ear, The teacher is here and is asking for you. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews with her sobbing, a deep anger welled up within him and he said, Where did you put him? Master, come and see, they said. And Jesus wept. The Jews said, Look how deeply he loved him. Others among them said, if he had loved him so much, why didn't he do something to keep him from dying? After all, he opened the eyes of a blind man. And Jesus, the anger again welling up within him, arrived at the tomb. It was a simple cave in the hillside with a slab of stone laid against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. The sister of the dead man, Martha, said, Master, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus looked her in the eye. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then to the others, go ahead, take away the stone. They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and prayed, Father, I'm grateful that you have listened to me. I know you always do listen. But on account of this crowd standing here, I've spoken so that they might believe that you sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And he came out, a cadaver, wrapped from head to toe, with a kerchief over his face. And Jesus told them, Unbind him, let him loose. So may God bless to our understanding this scripture. So my friends, we've heard this passage from the story of Lazarus. It's a story that we know really well. There are three resurrection type stories throughout the, the Gospels um, that are t uh, we take note of. The first involves the raising of the daughter of Jairus. The other is the raising of the son of the widow of Nain. And then there's this one, the Lazarus one. This is the big one. This is the one that would ultimately seal Jesus' fate. In the eyes of the Pharisees, Jesus would become just too powerful at this time. Because of the fact that Lazarus had been dead for a number of days, um, the fact that Jesus would go forward and raise him from the dead would definitely be something that would get the attention of the people and make the people realize that Jesus was a very powerful individual. So we find ourselves kind of wondering, what can we really take from this example or this message that Jesus is trying to communicate to us through this story? Well, and the thing I take from it is how Jesus is saying death does not have the final say. The core of what I think is our, our Christian message is that death doesn't have the final say. There is so much more. Um, God has so much more to offer, and God promises us new life and gives us that tangible hope. 
And so here's Lazarus, dead, so dead he's stinky, and Jesus is saying, come on out and unbind him. Take away the things that show that he's dead because he's not anymore. Take away the things that would hold him back from living. And so it's a, a beautiful image of Jesus saying new life exists. This promise of new life exists. And here's Lazarus embodying it. And isn't that such a helpful message in these times? In these times where our promises of hope and new life, the things that we cling to as Christians are sort of put on the line and maybe even put at risk by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that's happening right now. The fear and the anxiety, the uncertainty, we don't know as we're being told to stay home and, and not go anywhere and not touch each other, keep six feet apart and say, just don't be in contact with other people. And that's really hard to do, and it's really uncertain, and it causes a lot of angst for all of us, I think. Yes. I think that's a fair comment to say. And here's Jesus saying, but, but this isn't the end of it. There's more. There's more to, the, to life than this. This will not have the final say. Yeah. God's promise of new life and hope will. And so I think Christ calls us to take away the, those things that bind us, the fear that keeps the hope held up tight, the f anxiety that says this is the end. Christ calls us to, to remove those things and break through those things and set hope and new life free. So I wonder what ways we might have seen that happening or what ways we might be able to live into that because Christ calls those who are with him in that story to do that for Lazarus. It's something we do for each other. We can't do by ourselves. It's part of being Christian community. So what ways do you see that happening? Well, I think that definitely, I mean, we find the theme uh, connected with even last week, We're talking about hope, as, as Reverend Aaron has mentioned. You know, Paul, again, mentions a hope is what what basically marks the Christian. And so as we are called to be able to be bringers of hope in our world, to be able to help set that hope loose in the lives of others, one of the ways in which we can do that, I think, is um, the seminarian that is studying with me this year in the parish made a comment this morning in his reflection about the fact that many of us, for example, with our phones, have contact lists. And there are people on that contact list uh, if you're like me, there are people that it's been a while since I've been in contact with this individual. But perhaps if we scroll down that contact list, we'd be able to take a look at some of the names that are there, praying about it and seeing maybe there's somebody on that list that Christ will touch our heart with to be able to say, I could reach out to this individual and see how they're doing. How can I bring some hope into their life during this bleak time to let them know that they're not forgotten, that there's a connection, that they are um, thought of, that they're loved? Um, you know, these are some of the small little things that we're able to do. Some of you with uh, Facebook and so forth, I'm sure there are people as well that you could reach out to. There are all kinds of ways in which we can reach beyond ourselves to help set free, set, make loose that hope that is so needed in our world and our society during this dark time. And the glory of it is, when we reach out and help someone else and connect with someone else, non-physically, we are we're doing it for ourselves too. Yeah. We can we can help each other out. There's a mutuality and a beauty, and God's grace is made tangible in those ways. And so, something we can all do yeah. for each other. And isn't that glorious, that we're able to live into this promise of hope and new life? Yes. So may God bless us as we do the work of being Christ's hands and feet and body in this world. Amen. Amen. Let's open our hearts and our minds in prayer. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the ways that you're present with us. And we give you thanks that you know the prayers that are on our hearts, even before our, our lips utter them aloud. And we give you thanks for the Holy Spirit that sighs, or that prays with us, for it was sighs too deep for words. And so God, in this time, 
we pray for those of us who are feeling particularly anxious, depressed, uncertain amidst all that's going on with this pandemic. We pray for those of us who are feeling isolated, who are unable to get out and get what we need, who have no one who's able to do that for us. For those of us who are feeling the pinch, the economic pinch, and are worried where next meal might come from. We pray for those of us who are wondering whether we should pay for our hydro or the rent or our meals. God, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of fear. And so we lift this to you, knowing that you are able to take it and transform it and bring about good. And so unbind us from this fear, this anxiety, this isolation, and help us to, to live into hope and help tangible help to come our way. We also pray for those of us who are on the front line, who are working hard in the hospitals and the healthcare facilities and the nursing homes, those who are working in the grocery stores, the pharmacists, those in funeral direction, the truckers who are carrying all kinds of goods across our country to help fill our stores. We pray for all those who are putting themselves out there for the sake and the benefit of their brothers and sisters across this country, that God will keep them safe, take care of them, watch over them, and bless them during this difficult time. God, this pandemic has touched us in any number of ways around the world. It's affected our economies. It's affected our well-being. And so we pray for those who are affected by this pandemic, especially those who've been physically affected, who've, who are suffering with COVID-19, who are recovered. We give you thanks. Those who've died, we mourn. And we ask that you bless their families and help them to grieve. And God, we, we pray for all who are suffering as a result of this pandemic. And joining also those prayers individually that we have in our own hearts, that we have kept with ourselves during this time. We offer those to the Lord as well. So let's join together saying the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God bless us as we journey through the wilderness of Lent and journey through the wilderness of our own lives. And as we do that, may we be blessed by the God of hope who goes with us every day, the God who promises new life and peace that passes all understanding. May it be so. Amen. Amen.